This week on the docket, the Republican National Convention dominated headlines here in Tampa, but it's not the only race in town or in the state of Florida. In the first of our candidates forums, we welcome exclusively Elizabeth Belcher and Gail Gottlieb. On the docket starts right now. For the Hawk TV Broadcast Center in Ybor City, this is On the Docket with Felix Vega. And hello everyone and welcome to a very special edition of On the Docket broadcasting from our beautiful atrium here in our Student Services Building at Hillsborough Community College's Ybor campus. Now when I started On the Docket last November as a radio show, I got a unique platform to cover a lot of things from local news to politics and everything in between. And that's why I'm very happy to, for, to have our first candidates forum here on the docket and two very special ladies who I met in Ybor City a couple of weeks ago, actually. Gail Gottlieb, you are the uh, House Democratic candidate for District 59. And also Elizabeth Belcher, you are the State Senate candidate for District 24. Um, ladies, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Felix. Glad to be here. Great. Um, Elizabeth, I want to start with you. Um, you've had what most would consider a very rewarding career. Uh, in the government and also in the library system as well. Why are you jumping in this hornet's nest of politics at this stage of the game in your life? Well, I, I need to clarify one thing. The um, library, I was just a volunteer. Okay. I, I didn't work there. I worked as a friend of the library. I was the president of that for the Sefner Mango community. Uh, and what happened was that myself, along with a lot of other people, fought to get that library built. And I have never heard anything negative about that library. It's a beautiful building. I've got to make a commercial here. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only library in the Hillsborough County system that has a theme of math and science. And once we fought for it, we got it, and we, we supported it. I go by there and see all the cars there, all the people there, and it just gives you a wonderful feeling to know I did that. I helped to do that. And there is so many things wrong with our state that... I feel a need to go out and make, I hate to say make a difference, but sure. address those issues and bring them forward. And um, Gail, you actually jumped in your race for very um, di different reasons, some similar reasons to um, Elizabeth. Talk to us about why you got into your race uh, in the first place. Well, um, I want to make a difference, of course. Anybody who's running for office and doesn't want to make a difference maybe should stay home. Good point. Uh, <laughs> um, and, I feel I bring a unique background to the race, too. I grew up in Brandon. It is my hometown. I went all through school there. It's my community. I care about it so much. Um, my background is as a lawyer, um, but I've spent my entire career in public service, every bit of it, um, from working on behalf of working people and um, uh, making sure they get their unemployment compensation when they need it, uh, negotiating agreements for things like telecommuting to help balance work and family life and ease road congestion, um, managing a program for victims of labor and sex exploitation to help them rebuild their lives, teaching in a low-income school, and uh, um, also doing a range of public policy work from higher ed to drawing attention to the very, very serious dangers which are posed by unsustainable public debt and addressing the problems in ways that reflect our values. I'm very oriented toward solutions, finding what works, and what works for the entire community. And it's interesting you bring up um, solutions and also fixing problems. I know the economy has been front and center in a lot of people's minds, not only here in the Bay Area, but also across the state since both of you are running for um, state office. Elizabeth, let me ask you, what do you think needs to change on the statewide level uh, as far as the economy, get the economy moving forward again? to get the economy moving forward again. One, as long as the, uh, Florida continues to misspend money, we're not going to be addressing problems. And what I mean by misspending money is things like the Taj Mahal courthouse or the airline hangar. Those, those in, that money should have been directed back into the state to, to the programs that we really need to address. The other thing is, and it, it brings back in, it comes back into my belief of economy and environment, is the fact that we, we, we have what we call brownfields here. There's one, as an example, in north, um, north of I-4, it's called Taylor Road Landfill. It's a closed landfill. It's a brown, what they call brownfield. And my belief is that what we should be doing is partnering public and private money to build solar farms on those 
pieces of land that are not usable in any other way. And once we do that, we, we create jobs. We create stable jobs that can't be outsourced. We spend, we sell the, the electricity to TECO. We receive funding. The funds come back into the to the state, into the county, without raising without raising taxes. And uh, Gail, let me ask you the same question. What do you think um, will really kickstart the economy and get us moving in the right direction again and get unemployment down, which I think is everyone's goal across the state? And it's not just unemployment, it's underemployment as well. And it's also people who are working in their chosen careers but simply cannot um, cannot support their families in a way that allows for a brighter future for them. Um, I think the first thing we need to do is reject this false dichotomy, dichotomy between community and business. It's absolutely wrong. The two are interconnected. They need to be united. Um, we need a business community that um, realizes that we cannot starve our communities and our families and still have the flourishing um, economy that we need. Have you uh, met both on the com campaign trail people that are in more of that underemployment um, category? Absolutely. And your district is, um, you're actually out towards Riverview, Brandon. That's right. Progress Village. Yes. Um, now, what is the chief concern for the people that you're talking to? Is it a lot of these policies that the Democrats and Republicans talk about, social policies, or are they mostly focused on their families and getting their lives back together. Well, they do go together, really, very much so, especially um, if Florida continues to, um, to undermine communities. The state of Florida does not support its schools, does not support it, its parks, the things that make our communities worth living. We cannot attract the kind of um, businesses of the future. We, um, we will continue to have a low-tech, low-skill economy, and families know that as well. If they themselves don't have a way of getting the skills they need and they don't see their children having access to the kind of skills that tomorrow will bring, they are in despair. Um, and so it's un underemployment, unemployment, lack of skills, mismatch between those job vacancies that are out there and the skills that everyday Floridians can bring. Elizabeth, let me t turn to you and stay on the same subject for a while. Um, I find it interesting as a prosecutor, and a lot of my friends that are attorneys, Gail, I think you can relate to this as well, they, we find ourselves um, 60000 100000 $180,000 in debt because we had a dream, because yes. we wanted to make ourselves mm -hmm. um, better and go to school and go beyond to grad school and med school and law school. I've seen the past 12 years I've been an attorney numerous times legislation go up to the House and Senate only stall regarding gut, uh, debt forgiveness for one on the part of, of government attorneys and also public attorneys as well. But across the broad, broader range, people that want to go to med school and grad school is like, how do we make it affordable for them uh, on the statewide level where they can attain those dreams but not be drowning in debt for 10, 15, 20 years out after they get out of school? Well, let's start with the fact that you said 12 years. The Republican legislature actually the Florida legislature, but it is the Republican legislature, has been in total control for the last 14 years. And we need to start addressing those issues that you were talking about, where we can actually uh, provide opportunities for people to get uh, forgiveness of debt. Years ago, there was um, the, gov the federal government forgave debt if you became a teacher, if you become a public servant right. at some point. I know, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but other states do have these types of forgiveness programs, correct? Um, I'm not aware of any, but I'm sure there are. I, I, let's put it this way, I sincerely hope there are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. <laughs> yes. um, in addition, then, we need to start truly funding our education at the, the level that they're supposed to be funded at. The, the Florida Constitution requires 60% of the funds that come into the, to the coffers to be spent on education. The lottery is supposed to be in addition to that. So that's on top of the 60%. Yes, it's on top of the Interesting. Hmm. Yes, that is not being done right now. And as I said, we can, we can partner with public and private enterprises to do these solar farms, to do the um, burning of garbage to create electricity, to bring down the cost. We use off, off the oil, foreign oil, and bring, bring funds back into our government that will, of course, be 60% to the, to the revenue, to the schools. 
and help address those issues that you're talking about. And Gail, same question to you. What do you think um, the government needs to do on the statewide level, the legislature, and, and in particular the House, to really help students like us that are you know, going to grad school and want to go to grad school? Because quite frankly, you can't get many jobs nowadays without some sort of graduate degree. Wonderful, wonderful question, and it gets right to the heart of so many of Florida's problems. I might also add, though, it's not just the graduate and professional degrees. It's access to our community colleges and our four-year institutions as well. I was really heartened um, to see last year um, more authorization of student loans from the federal government, and then more recently, stabilization of the interest rates. Right, absolutely. Students. Absolutely terrific. Um, what I'd like to see also, though, is more oversight over the some of the for-profit career colleges, which just have a, a abysmal rate of graduation, saddle these um, students who are often working people, young working people with tremendous loans, uh, have a terrible default rate, and these default these defaulted on loans are very, very often subsidized by taxpayers. That is um, really warrants some very close examination because that's money being spent unwisely, as Elizabeth was saying. Um, and on the community college, you brought up a good point, because obviously we're here at Hillsborough Community right. College, and I, I know this is, was a great institution. Wonderful I actually institution. graduated from USF. I came back here to school in 2009 looking for my second career. That's so terrific. I, you know, I actually, you know, it brings it all home being here and you know, hosting the show here, and I think that's a great point that the community colleges also serve such a great benefit to people that are you know, either looking for a second career, starting their lives over, really. It cannot be underestimated. It absolutely cannot be. But um, do we, I know in my own community, Brandon, I, I know of a family, a very good friend of mine who graduated from high school along with me. Her daughter um, went to a magnet school in Tampa. Right. So the family has a very modest income. She had a scholarship, um, one of, Florida has some very small scholarship programs. Bright Futures sure. is, is, doesn't have the reach it should have. In any case, she had this scholarship, but because of her economic situation, she had to work so many hours that she just simply couldn't keep up with her demanding studies. She was studying to be a, a biologist. You know, it's a wonderful career. She had to drop that. She lost her grades dipped. She lost wow. the scholarship, and now she is out. She is absolutely out of higher ed. And let me just add also how she was able to qualify for the program in the first place. It was because her family, <coughs> modest income, the man who had served as her stepfather, and always as her stepfather for years, was not married to her mother. And they didn't marry for a very specific reason. Combining those two incomes would have just pushed them just outside out of, that of the reach. Out of the reach. And um, now that's a pity. Look how that undermines our families, our economy, our future. And it's a small tragedy. Not a small tragedy. It's a, it's a big tragedy for one person, multiply that by many, many others. Absolutely. As for the student loan forgiveness program, uh, I'm a, I am really afraid to say that unless we have some big changes in Tallahassee, which Elizabeth and I would like to be part of, I don't see us moving in the right direction there. That's why we're running and yeah, to change things like that. Really, there's no funding there public, is the, the reality of right. it. We need to encourage professionals to go into public service. And it's not only the student debts that they'll be facing, but it's the fact that our public servants, pro professionals, like doctors and lawyers, they get paid substantially less than they could make in the for-profit private sector world. I know, Elizabeth, you and I were talking about that before the show started. As a prosecutor, I know that firsthand. You do. And you know, for the past you know, 12 years, I've worked in Fort Lauderdale and here, and it's hard. And you know, the other thing is like, you know, we only get paid once a month and because it's cheaper to do it that way. Um, what sort of things would, where would you draw the funding from? You talked about renewable entry, energy, which I think is a very interesting prospect to bring into the mix for um, extra funding. Where else can we look for funding to start this ball rolling that we've been talking about? Again, I go back to the ethics in government, that we need to absolutely address the ethics in government, that we are spending our money unwisely, that the Airplane hanger, I keep going back to the airplane hanger in uh, Destin, I believe it was. Right, in the Panhandle, yes, yeah. Right. Yes, that that came out of the uh, school's budget. The, the school budget for South, for, uh, South Hillsboro has a um, Brandon Community uh, Active Advantage Center that is coming out of HCC budget. 
these are things that are not promoting education. These are not helping you to go beyond the education. We need to, to start addressing not only creating income flows, but spending it wisely. And that's a good point. To segue into our next topic, I want to talk about the redistricting, because both of you actually caught me in a huge mistake that I was about to <laughs> yes. make coming on the show today. Elizabeth, your district actually shifted in 2012 from the East Coast, um, just south of where I grew up in Daytona Beach. It was, used to be, I believe, Titusville, Ver, Ver, parts of Brevard County, inland on the Beachline Expressway. And then now you're running for the same district, in District 24, over here on I-75. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? And again, I'm gonna ask you the same question in a second, but with your district, you went from one side of the state to the other. How did the redistricting happen in that manner? The uh, census always requires a new redistricting to address the population moves. And what happened was that they also passed what they called fair districting last time, uh, 2010, I believe? Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, where- We can all tag team, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right. Right. Yeah. Where they were supposed to be compressed and contiguous. Yes, that's right. Compact. <laughs> and, and really make them smaller is what is basically more yes. More sensible. More sensible. Yes. That you wouldn't jump from one spot to another. If you looked at the way the districting was done prior to this, it was like spaghetti noodles, like all over the place, right. different things, and. Now we have an, at least an, uh, a start towards more fair districting. And once they did that, they also all remember all the districts and stuff. And that's how you ended up, your district ended yep. up over here. On, uh, yes. And then, Gail, I, when I was emailing you back and forth, you actually uh, pointed out that we changed one of the districts as, as well because that's I right. had you from Tampa over to USF and here and there, and you're actually more west now. How did that it's, end up? It's funny, Felix. I know you're a journalist and very interested in getting everything just correct. Exactly. And that's why I offered to, to prove to you I was going to bring an official, I did bring an official map just to right. see that I wasn't just <laughs> making it up. Um, and it's funny, um, what did you mention, Elizabeth, that it, some of the districts have been shaped like noodles? Right. And that's funny, the word gerrymander actually is a play on the word salamander um, because... Uh, really? Yes, it is. Um, the original uh, cry against gerrymandering was uh, a politician named Jerry, a New England politician, right. who was said to have created districts that were as crooked and twisted as a salamander. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> they call it a gerrymander. Um, that I just want to say that I am very happy with the way District 59 is now. I couldn't be more pleased that it includes it includes my hometown and the communities that make sense to be connected to it. Riverview, where I spent so much time as a youth, um, Valrico. So in my case, I, I feel very pleased with it. I'm, you know, delighted. And Elizabeth, do you feel the same way about how 24 also was redrawn as well? Oh yes, very much so. And you're actually covered from Pasco all the way down to uh, Pasco County line, I believe. Mm -hmm. You told me you have one little spike that goes up into Pasco County. Yes, one little spike that goes into Pasco County. It starts from. Pasco County goes down to Highway 674, which is almost basically at the very end bottom of uh, Hillsborough County. Um, then the county line uh, for Polk and I-75. And what are, I know just being down, uh, I have friends that live in Ruskin, actually own a tree farm oh. uh, down in Ruskin, Sun City Tree Farm. And what are, and you're going out and you were talking about renewable energy and really the environment and uh, things that could be really be changed. It's like, do you think there's a strong sense of the farming community and also the agriculture community here in Florida, since we are a very agriculture-centered state? Do you see that growing as well, and people actually going back into that as you're on the campaign trail? Elizabeth, I'll start with you. I sincerely hope so. I really and truly believe that we need to protect our farmers. And I'll give you my statement, is that if you think that we're in trouble by being dependent on foreign oil, think what's going to happen if we ever become dependent on foreign food. So I, need, I think we need to address the issue of keeping our farmers on the farm, that it is more profitable for them to continue farming than instead of selling to developers. And yes, in the- um, And we've seen a lot of that, especially I you know in South County, Apollo Beach, there were huge tracts of land that now became, you know, these giant subdivisions, because I've been driving up and down 41, mm -hmm. going to Ruskin for, you know, 10, 12 years, and I was surprised I'd leave, you know, I moved to Fort Lauderdale and I come back and then there's, boom, a huge housing development there. And I was like, well, where did all the farmland go and right. how did that switch out so fast? So it's important that they, the redevelopment 
do you think it should stop in order to allow the farms to regrow and actually repopulate uh, in that area? I think that what we should start doing is encouraging infill growth. We have a lot of, of empty land, empty tracks, especially in the urban area. There's actually a line in Hillsborough County between the urban area and the, the agricultural area. And people don't realize this, but the agriculture is, it isn't the first, it's certainly the second business income in our county. And we can, we can do things as, like you were talking about your friend who owns a tree farm. The FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation, when they widen roads, they are not required, and they take down the trees and cut out, cut down, they're not required to replant. So I find that very unacceptable that, that they should be required, if they cut down a tree, to replant the tree. It's, it, it will provide funding for farmers. It will provide a quality of life because people, people feel better when there's trees and shade and things like that. Sure. And you know, one of the other big stories, and you're probably going to be front and center in this if you get elected. I'm sorry, you wanted to jump oh, in there no, real I, quick. I just, sorry. I just want to applaud so much that Elizabeth said, but, and also echo that agriculture is the unsung hero of Florida's economy. Um, we see this sprawl, these big developments that often turn into outposts of, of, of uh, desolation, mm -hmm. you know, as they go bust. And um, that's because it seemed more profitable at the time. It would, you know, farmers couldn't help, they couldn't make a profit off of the farming, so they sold to developers and such. So we have to also remember that aside from the economic, the direct economic benefit of agriculture, it's part of Florida's heritage. It's part of what people Good like point. to see. When they come here, I remember uh, having a visitor uh, from the Northeast, her delight in the orange groves. She couldn't believe how beautiful this was, that we had, had these, these orange groves, or that we had these vistas where people grazed cattle. That's part, of, that's part of our collective heritage and needs to be nurtured. And some things we could do from the economic front, um, the Fresh from Florida promotion program is absolutely wonderful, um, but we also need to invest more in agricultural research, developing crops that are specific for our climate, resistant to whatever they need to be resistant to, um, can thrive in our periodic droughts, um, and also look at other things to really up it a little bit in Florida. For instance, developing produce that sells for more, but has... Um, or bang the, for the buck, so to speak. That's right, that's right. Sometimes that means a really encouraging innovation. Again, we need to do that through And going back to our too. education that's discussion right. as well. That's right, and research, but also other programs to make it possible, for instance, for that farmer who does develop a specialty crop to be able to get crop insurance for it. Because, um, it's just too high a risk for somebody who is an innovator and an entrepreneur to develop a crop that could be wiped out in the course of two days by a freeze and know that it was impossible to get insurance for it. Or even the hurricanes, as That's we've right. seen as well, That's the flooding. Right. We need to nurture it, and you know that can be for our long-term glory, really. I'd like to see Florida be able to glory in um, producing some really, really first-rate products that are known around the world. It takes money to do that. Exactly. One other thing um, I wanted to talk about real quick, uh, kind of on the, along the same lines of the econ economy, the foreclosure problem here in Florida has really, really not only clogged the court system, but has been one of the biggest um, drains on the economy and also like we've been talking about, people getting back on their feet. Elizabeth, how would you um, try to fix that problem, implementing some sort of legislation that would really streamline the foreclosure process and protect those people that are becoming the victims of foreclosures in the state. Well, again, we should introduce the concept of ethics, ethics in business as well as the government, because the mortgage problem started with uh, the people who were selling houses to people who were obviously not qualified, right. them, financially not qualified for them. I saw a article in the paper a day or two ago where I believe it's the Bank of America is offering to renegotiate, lower the mortgage uh, balance on people's homes and renegotiate their payments. This is a good first step. The problem becomes is one, people don't believe that it's real. True, there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of distrust, sure. I mean, you, yes. you have to I admit. Mean, you know, uh, it's too good of a deal to be true kind of thing. And the other thing is that the only the people they are addressing are people who are behind in their payments for a couple of months. 
And we also need to address the people who have been um, fair, who have followed the rules, who have, who have scrimped and saved and managed to make sure that their mortgages are being paid on time. And they should be allowed to, to enter into this program also. And one of the other things, Gail, let me ask you about this along the foreclosure things is, as a lawyer again, the, I see the court system, I have friends that are foreclosure attorneys and they tell me horror stories about what their clients are going through. What are some other remedial measures that can be put in place locally mm -hmm. um, in the court system that can help the problem uh, vet it, itself out? Right now, the Florida has an enormous length of time that it takes to move a house through the foreclosure process. I think I saw, um, well, I might be taking this from an industry source, but I, I trust that it's um, well researched 600 days, more or less 600 wow. days it can take. Um, Florida relies on judicial processes to do that, and those wheels grind sometimes very slowly. I certainly believe that that there's enough blame to go around in the foreclosure crisis. Um, but we do need to find some way of moving these houses out of the foreclosure process and back onto the market. One thing that could be done is we can encourage banks and credit unions um, to offer more liens in lieu of foreclosure. This saves the homeowner from a bankruptcy determination, Good brings point. the house to the, to the market, um, which is better for the banks too. You know, um, One thing uh, Floridians should be aware of though, once this big backlog of houses and foreclosure proceedings comes back onto the market, we could expect to see housing prices drop. Again. Yes, but this this is just a matter of supply and demand. Right, right. It's not a, a long-term harbinger of terrible things. It's it would We can expect to see a dip, which we would then climb out of. And so it's basically better leveling out and readjusting itself. Yes, that's right. That's right. I was really happy to see this um, the settlement come through. Finally, it was at a national level to address people who have been victims of the robo-signing fraud. Right. <laughs> and uh, that's terrible. I'm disappointed on the state level, though, to see that our government in Tallahassee, by slashing the Office of um, Financial Regulation, has cut half of the regional offices that were investigating mortgage fraud. And um, this is... This is that is something that both problem. of you agree that you should change when, if you get to Tallahassee? Oh, yes. Mortgage fraud, every kind of fraud needs to be right, right, but negotiated, I mean, too. Other things that we could do, as I mentioned, I do think there's plenty of blame to go around. Um, this aggressive marketing of loans to people who really couldn't afford them, and financial institutions betting on, on the failure. And the failure, right. That's terrible. But also, homeowners also need to be more realistic when they borrow money. Uh, about their ability to repay it. And we can help them to be more realistic also by making sure that um, we could, for instance, require that loan agreements be put in language that an everyday person can clearly understand. Then it would be much, fraud would be cut down on, and it would be much harder for people to say, I didn't know sure. that this would happen. And then just on the personal responsibility level too, the, these foreclosed homes blight our neighborhoods. And, um, and drag down the value of all homes in the neighborhood. And it really affects everyone in that, in really that neighborhood does. in the long run. And I would really urge homeowners, whether your, your house is paid for, whether you're doing just fine with your mortgage payments, whether it's underwater, whatever your situation, it doesn't cost very much. It costs nothing to pick up litter. It costs very little to mow the grass. And I might also encourage people in the, sense, in the spirit of community to take your lawnmower and maybe mow the grass on that house that's been sitting vacant too. It Good idea. It helps everybody. Uh, ladies, real quick, I wanted um, my directors are giving me the cue to wrap up in a little bit. Um, big night here last night in Tampa, big week for Tampa on the world stage, regardless of party affiliation. Um, the Republican National Convention uh, has come through here. They survived Hurricane Isaac. Obviously, the front page of the Tampa Bay Times this morning was um, Mitt's promise to America. Let me get your take on the presidential race on both sides. What do you think is one weakness? I'm going to ask it that way first that Democrats and Republicans need to deal with on the national stage in order to secure a victory in the White House. Elizabeth, what do you think? The big issue in this economy, in this, this election, excuse me, the, is the economy. We need to address the economy. We have to be able to give some plans on how to go forward. The other thing is that when I go out and I talk to people in my district, what is really interesting is that there's so many people who say, we need to come together, we need to find the common ground to go forward on these issues, to address these issues. And it doesn't matter whether Democrat or Republican or Independent, they're pretty much fed up with the idea of 
the extremes on both parties. We need to start talking to the middle. We need to start agreeing. We need to start deciding that, okay, I can't do this, but I can do this, and we can go forward with these things. And Gail, how do you see that dialogue opening up on the national level, if, if at all? I mean, we've got, like Elizabeth was saying, we've gone so far left and right, and it's really, they're fighting for, you look at the polls, like really five to 6% of the entire electorate that unfortunately is going to decide the, the election. How do you open the lines of communication where we get past this partisanship? Well, I, well, I hate to answer you in a way that sort of sounds as though contradictory <laughs> you a little bit. I don't feel that we've gone so far left and so far right. Yes, there's a great deal of partisanship, but I don't feel it. I feel as though actually both parties are moving, well, the Democrats are moving farther toward the right more and more moderate, I guess, more and more bipartisan, by bi 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 bipartisan, I mean incorporating ideas from both left Interesting and right. point, you're right. It doesn't, it's not just a matter of votes, it's the ideas that go into policy. Whereas in the other party is moving farther and farther to the right and embracing ideas that really in the economic sphere have long been discredited. This idea that um, through more and more corporate welfare, by more and more catering to the very, very wealthy in our society, somehow we will trickle down and it will, it will help everyone. Now, if we had never tried that idea before, well, I'd still be very skeptical because I think it's a cruel and, and, um, and ineffective way uh, of making policy change, but we've tried it. We've tried it. It's been decades now. It didn't work then, it hasn't worked. This idea of trickle down economics has been a failure. And uh, we, economists on left and right, actually, I'm talking about respected economists, not politicians. Respected economists on the left and the right recognize this as being a failure. And that's, I think, a good point to, to end on, is that people thinking they're listening to the politicians. When you look at the math, you look at the numbers, that's what people really need to be shown, um, essentially, in order to understand right. uh, on all these levels. Real quick, um, last question to both of you. One thing, if you're elected, what is your number one thing that you want to accomplish? Gail, I'll start with you. Oh, gosh. It's um, one thing. Come oh, on. Oh, I know it is only one thing. It's one thing that affects everything else, and that's ethics in Tallahassee. We need um, watchdogs with real teeth. We need the um, ethics offices to be able to initiate their own investigations. We need foreclosure, uh, disclosure of conflict of interest in a way that the general public can, can have access to, put it online. State of Louisiana recently passed an ethics reform. I think Barter would do well to, um, to look do that at that. as well. Yeah. Elizabeth, how about you? Well, I need to build on what Gail has said. And there is one small little detail that I would really love to see in, in Tallahassee. And that is when a elected official puts a line, budget line item in the, in the budget, that they have their name attached to it. So you can follow the money. Hmm. I have one particular instance where there was a $500,000 line item budget, um, and I could not find out who put that on there. I have, I have tried to do it myself. I have asked elected officials. Public records re uh, research. Research everything. And once a person has to take responsibility for whatever monies that they're trying to obtain from the, the government, from the state, that's going to make them more responsible just because, as saying, the sunshine. Eliminate the corruption tax that all Floridians pay each time a decision is made in Tallahassee on the basis of self-interest rather than the public's interest. Well said, we'll have to leave it there, ladies. Gail Gottlieb, Elizabeth Belcher, such a pleasure to have you here on the docket. This is a great uh, opportunity for us. I hope you'll come back and stop by in your campaign over the next couple of months in CSO. Pleasure having you, Gail. Come visit us in Tallahassee. Yes, definitely. Um, Thank you for having us. And that's going to do it for us here on the docket with our special candidates forum. Uh, we'll see you next time.